Welcome to the Hardcore MBA Podcast with your host, Erland Bakke. Hello and welcome to another episode of Hardcore MBA. Today I'm very, very, very excited. I'm actually meeting my uh, the first Lord. I've never met a Lord before. Uh, Lord Billy Moria is the founder of Cobra Beer. Um, it's also going to be the first episode where I have a beer, um, a Cobra beer, uh, which is a beer that goes really, really nicely with, with curry and that's actually how I got introduced to the, uh, the beer as well. Um, you've done many, many things in your life. You had an exciting entrepreneurial career, and now, uh, you know, in the House of Lords, uh, honorary doctorates, awards. Um, you, 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 you're very, very successful. And of course, on Hardcore MBA, we're interested in learning more about how that came about. Um, so, first question is, how has sort of, uh, with your family having a military background, how did that form you as a young child? It had a huge impact on me. I was very lucky to be brought up uh, with the Gurkhas. My father was commissioned the Gurkhas, uh, the bravest troops in the world, as Seal Marshal Manik Shaw said last, uh, I quoted in my speech last year in the House of Lords when I led the debate on the 200th anniversary of the Gurkha service to Britain and India, that if a man says he's not afraid of dying, he's either lying or he's a Gurkha. And their bravery is legendary, and I was brought up with them from childhood, including with two Victoria Cross winners. And so that privilege of being brought up in the army family, in the Gurkha family, uh, had a huge influence on me throughout my childhood and has influenced my life. And I have my father to thank for that. He was a great leader. He ended up uh, retiring as not only president of the Gurkha Brigade, the head of the Gurkhas in India, but also as commander in chief of the Central Army in India with 350,000 people under his command. So I was able to learn about leadership from the time I can remember when he was commanding a battalion of a thousand people to three hundred fifty thousand people, and just the leadership lessons were just invaluable. So um, you left for the UK. Why was UK the sort of destination uh, for you after graduating from? Um, you, you you did a degree in commerce, I believe. Yes. And then you decided to, that UK was the place. Why why did you make that? How did you make that decision? From, from India, when students go abroad to study. The most popular destinations are the United States of America and the UK. And my family have been educated in Britain for three generations. My father's father was commissioned at Sandhurst, the British Military Academy, one of the few Indians before India's independence was commissioned there. My my mother's father, my grandfather, was at Birmingham University. My mother attended Birmingham University. Her brother attended Birmingham University. So I was the third generation to go to university in the UK. And now my son is at university in the UK. Um. And when you when you studied, uh, you studied some um, some degrees that not aren't necessarily entrepreneurial degrees, accounting and and uh, and law. Um, they're very sort of rule based, whilst entrepreneurship is more about sort of breaking the rules and sort of figuring out new ways of doing things. Um, how come? How how how, did, how why did you choose those? And how did you sort of get started in entrepreneurship? I chose accountancy because it was a it's a very good training for business where you are um, when you train as a chartered accountant in the UK you are I was lucky to train with one of the top firms which is today EY and Young and it's a very professional environment training is very important uh, ongoing professional development is very important and you are auditing companies which means you've got to understand those companies you've got to understand those businesses and and most importantly, you're actually within the business. When you go and order to company, you're actually on their premises, in the factories, in amongst the employees. So you really get to understand business from inside a business. And uh, that's how I got exposed to some of Britain's best known entrepreneurs, by auditing their companies. Mm-hmm. And, and that was a wonderful insight and inspiration to me. And with the law, I, my favorite subject in my accounting studies was law. And I got the opportunity to do a law degree at Cambridge University. And I enjoyed the law and the way you study law. I don't necessarily remember the section numbers and the acts and the names of the cases that I studied, but the way that you study law, where you are invariably given a situation where A, B, and C do something, and um, what is your advice to A, what is your advice to B, what is your advice to C? And often there's no obvious correct answer, but to get to advising them 
practical uh, answer. You've got to look at cases, you've got to look at what judges have said, you've got to look at textbooks, you've got to look at journals, you've got to look at acts, draw on all this wide information and then narrow it down and focus it and apply it to a specific solution. So that ability to think widely and then focus in a practical way uh, was what I learned from the law, which is invaluable. So it's kind of, so let's if we view business as a game, um, it kind of sounds to me like you were learning the ground rules because in business you have to follow you know you got to pay your VAT you got to pay your your taxes uh, all these different rules right so as long as you play the game of business within the the, the rule system um, we can do well if we of course if we break those the rules of society that's uh, that's when you get put in jail, which we don't we don't want to make happen. Um, so, so did it give you a really good foundation then for really understanding the rules of the game? Is that what you were saying? The, it's more understanding business and having an insight to business and a way of thinking and approaching um, and analyzing. And those are skills that are really, really useful. And of course, when it comes to accountancy, charge accountancy, you learn about finance in great depth. So any business, finance is one of the most important issues, raising finance, managing your finances, and uh, I had a huge advantage being a qualified chartered accountant, uh, and in effect I was our finance director for the first five years of the business until I brought in, no, in fact more than that, um, even when I brought in an accountant, I was still fulfilling the finance director's role, and that, that was very, very useful, and in dealing with lawyers, although I didn't go on to be a solicitor or a barrister, I had enough of a legal training to be able to to understand the law, uh, and of course, you have to deal with legal matters throughout your business. So, and when it comes to, but on the other hand, when it comes to entrepreneurship, it is a different mindset altogether to be a lawyer or an accountant or a banker or a professional of any sort. Uh, being an entrepreneur is is a completely different world. Uh, I just finished reading um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, biography called uh, Total Recall. And in there, he kind of says, you know, from an age of 12, he kind of said, oh, I want to go to the, I want to go to California, I want to be like uh, Mr. Olympia, and uh, I want to star in the movies. He sort of found a role model that he wanted to be like. Was it like that for you at a very young age? Did you know about this entrepreneurial career, or was that something that came about later? I didn't, I didn't know at a very young age that I'd be an entrepreneur. I knew, I suppose, from the time I decided to go down the sort of, commerce route when I, uh, that I wanted to, for business as a career, I was quite open-minded about it, but I always wanted one day to run my own business because I, my mother's grandfather, my great-grandfather was an entrepreneur and he was a very successful entrepreneur, uh, Didi Italia, who uh, actually did a lot of public service, um, had a big family, looked after his family very well, I've never heard a bad word said about him. And then he eventually ended up becoming a member of the Upper House of Rajya Sabha in India, which is equal to the House of Lords here in the UK. So he was a huge influence on me. Um, and I was, um, I think he died when I was about three years old, so I don't, I don't really have clear memories of him, very faint memories of him. But his influence has been huge. And so I suppose there was a sort of one day I want to set up my own business like my great grandfather. And um, the Indian culture is very entrepreneurial. Um, why? How, what makes what makes Indian so so creative, so entrepreneurial, um, culturally? India is an amazing country. Uh, India uh, is a, a country of one point two five billion people that was suppressed during my childhood. It was a protected, inward, insular-looking uh, country. It was not a successful economy. Uh, and then, when nineteen ninety one India's liberalisation took place. Uh, it was unleashed, the entrepreneurial spirit in India was unleashed and um, you now see amazing entrepreneurial stories coming out of India, whether it's in the tech sector um, or the business outsourcing sector or manufacturing. We now in Cobra Beer have, uh, with my joint venture partners, lots of close three, three factories, three breweries in India, we're able to produce world-class beer, world-class manufacturing in India. So that Indian entrepreneurial spirit is amazing. And then there's this Indian term called Jugaad, uh, which is frugal innovation. And you see that at every level in India where uh, Indians innovate in the most amazing way. And of course, the extreme example of that is the, the Mars mission, where India, India's Mars mission was done at a fraction of the cost of 
the same mission uh, launched by NASA. So, so India has been to Mars. India has got a Mars program as we speak. Oh wow, uh, that's uh, that's that's very good. It's fantastic. Um, and you're playing polo at at Cambridge. Um, and what happens? Because this is this ignites your entrepreneurialism. This um, the, the the polo at Cambridge. Am I right? Yes, I, I've, I was lucky to learn how to ride at quite a young age. I always enjoyed it, loved it, and I got the opportunity to play polo um, and learned in India and played for Cambridge. And we, I organized and led the first Cambridge polo tour to India and then brought some sample polo sticks back with me and made a few phone calls, had a few meetings, and before I knew it, I was in business selling polo sticks uh, to Harrods, to Lily Whites, to the Royal Family Saddlers. And it got me off the ground. And you tried other ventures. Uh, what were these ventures and uh, what happened with them? We, uh, the, the big idea I had was the beer, which was uh, very much the big idea, which evolved while I was a student yeah. uh, at Cambridge. And that's when um, I, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> and, the, and the beer was, I knew it was very simple. I hated fizzy lagers. I love uh, real ale, English bitter. And I thought, well, how do I uh, create a beer that has the refreshment of a lager, the smoothness of a uh, that would have a uh, globally appealing taste, appeal to men and women alike, and accompany all food, and in particular curry and Indian food. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have another uh, taste of your lovely beer. Cheers. Mm. It's um, it's a very attractive brand, I must say. Um, the Cobra. I used to play when I. When I play golf, I use King Cobra clubs. Oh, yes. um, so why did you choose the name Cobra? We could have chosen any name, and in fact, the first name we chose was Panther. Okay. And that is what, as a leopard, that's what we were actually going to run with. And then um, we, my partner was trying to pre-sell the beer before we shipped it out from Bangalore, the first shipment, and he found that people didn't like the name Panther. And then we had gone through hundreds of names. We could have chosen any name we wanted to. And we're creating a brand from scratch and a beer from scratch. And so the second choice name was Cobra. And when he asked customers if they like Cobra, they love Cobra. And uh, you you know, why did they not like Panther is a very tangible thing. But they love Cobra and it's turned out to be a really great name. It's short, sharp, punchy, it takes you to India. Um, it's it sounds very cool and contemporary, but also it sounds as if it's been around around for a long time. Last year was our twenty fifth anniversary. So for a household beer name Hassel beer brand, we're very young. Most Hassel beer brands are often centuries old. And when we wanted to celebrate our 25th anniversary, we asked our consumers, and they said, no, 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 we thought Cobra was 125 years old. <laughs> so that people think it's been around for a long time, uh, which is a good thing. And, uh, we, the name has just been, it's our most valuable asset, Cobra. I know, I know in the Sikh religion, uh, like a Cobra has a special, um, special place. Some friends of mine are Sikhs and they, they always said they have these uh, cobra heads, king cobra heads in, in their house, uh, but I can't remember uh, the original. So I thought maybe the cobra beer was going to tie to something related to, to uh, but it was it was testing. You tested different names and... Yes, the there's no connection, a religious connection at all. But in fact, we don't show the snake uh, in any, not, not on the packaging, not on advertising. Uh, we, Sure right. Interesting. So it's just the name. Just the name. Yes. Um, so between the polo sticks and the bear, uh, you had some other. You tried and tested some other ventures as well. Am I right? Yes. And so we, in, in building up the experience, we we tried um, because Cobra was a big idea, a big project. We weren't ready for it mm. to start off the business. So the polo sticks. We imported leather and silk items. We imported. Um, uh, high fashion items, we sold them to Selfridges, to Boutiques, and Knightsbridge. We tried things that didn't work. We imported pearls from Hyderabad, the city my partner Arjun and I came from. Um, we both from Hyderabad, Hyderabad's famous for pearls. And we just couldn't sell a single string, string of pearls because the Japanese pearls were better quality and better value. And uh, we tried uh, importing bath styles. We had the agency for Bombay dyeing. The biggest, one of the biggest textile companies in, in India gave us the agency for their bath styles. We couldn't sell a single bath towel because the bath towels from Portugal were better 
better quality and cheaper and much closer to transport. So uh, there were a lot of dead ends and you know in, in business you were no never give up is one of my mottos. Mm. But on the other hand you need to know when to give up. So you, you tried um, many things because a lot of people you know they'll, they'll, they'll look at an entrepreneur like yourself and be like Oh yeah, you know, you did this and you did that, and everything worked out well. And and um, you you're you're different than I because, or different than than, than the person viewing it because, you know, you you were lucky. Uh, the reason why I wanted to, you to talk about these other things that you've done is because you probably tried you know ten or twenty different things and put your heart and soul into them, and then they didn't work. But then you had to say, oh, well, I'm going to try something else. And then you know you find the right combination, and then that works, and then you scale that up. Uh, is that is that a pretty appropriate? Is that correct? Well, the, the, I shared the platform. Um, can we just pause for one second, please? Sure. Yeah. So we can carry on. You asked me about how do you build? How do you build? When do you decide? When? Well, I, I guess I guess a lot of people view like the success stories as like a, a straight line, but it's actually like a squiggly line that goes all over the place because you tried, you know, bath tiles and pearls and this and that, and you with the polo sticks it worked. Like you, then you, you sort of got your your first proof of success. You said like, oh, there's an opportunity here. There's a problem. These are better. I can I can serve a market. I'll solve a problem. And then you said, oh, maybe I could do that with other things, right? What? Uh, I shared the platform with Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, and yeah. both of us unprompted said the same thing. So on one hand, you never give up as an entrepreneur. On the other hand, you know when to give up. So if you're facing a dead end, like I did with the bath towels or the pearls, there's no point going going ahead. You've got to know you've got to give up because you're not going to succeed. But on the other hand, something like Cobra, the moment we sold Cobra to the restaurants, from day one we got almost 100% repeat orders. When you get those repeat orders, you have the confidence to keep going and extrapolate that into a global beer brand. So it becomes very apparent um, whether you should carry on and whether something has potential. If something has potential, then whatever the obstacles are, you will find a way around those obstacles and you don't give up. One thing that I um, enjoyed with your video on, on Lord Billy Moria dot uk was uh, there's one word you hear a lot in entrepreneurship. And that word is no, no, no. no. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Uh, how do we? How do you deal deal with rejection? Like because in entrepreneurship, there's a lot of rejection, and I've I've interviewed uh, many entrepreneurs, and one thing that happens to a lot of people that start in business is that their self confidence gets kind of um, they lose a lot of self confidence because they hear a lot of no, a lot of no, and there's a lot of resistance. I guess my my question to you is. Um, what kind of habits and, and mindset do you have in terms of uh, per, uh, per, 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 uh, perseverance in, um, in keep on, keeping on going? You, the best definition of luck is uh, when determination meets opportunity. So if you're not determined, you won't even see the opportunity. And I, I picture it as waves going past you. And if you're determined, you might just catch that wave. And when you have that determination, when you have that belief in yourself, in your product, in your brand, that is what enables you to cross that credibility gap. When you have no credibility, nobody knows you, nobody knows your brand when you start. And why should people finance you, supply you, buy from you? And they do that if you have that belief and confidence and faith in yourself, which gives people the faith to trust you to give you a chance. And then, of course, people are resistant to change. And if you're going to walk, as we did, you walk into a restaurant in our early days, in a battered Citroën de Chabot called Albert, which cost £295, which needed push starting every day, where you could see the road through the floor of the car when you were driving through the holes in the floor of the car. And you go into a restaurant and you say, here's the best ever in can be an extra smooth, less gassy, goes really well with the food, and it's more expensive than our competitors. And they say, well, why do we need another brand? And you've then got to try and persuade them to take something they don't think they need quite right to think that. And you will then convince them and persuade them to give you a chance. And I was very lucky because the restaurant has said, okay, this product is so fabulous. Um, a lot of them didn't drink for religious reasons. Two thirds of the restaurants are owned and run by Bangladeshis. The other one third by Pakistanis, Sri Lankans, Indians. They said, so it doesn't matter, we don't drink, it's our customers that matter. Leave a couple of samples, we'll try it with our regulars. If they like it, we'll put it on 
a first order of thumb, why the customers like it or real. And they give you that chance, then your product is sort of developed it. And of course, then you get other obstacles because of the big bottles of Cobra, they wanted, they wanted small bottles of draft, and then you, you turn obstacles into advantages. And when they say, no, we don't want this big bottle, you say, well, hang on, the big bottle is how beer is sold in India. The big bottle enables people to share the beer. The big bottle means you can leave the bottle on the table and people can share the beer like they share the food at an Indian restaurant. And then the waiters can go and do other things. The big bottles mean that people at other tables will say, what are they drinking? It looks like a bottle bottle of wine, not a bottle of wine, it's a bottle of beer and it's spread like wildfire around the restaurant. So suddenly you've turned an obstacle and a no into a huge advantage. Mm. So what do you think made you so determined? I think uh, if you really, really believe in what you're doing and you're passionate about it, then you're determined. Um, in terms of, of, of uh, habits in your life, do you have, so in, in the sort of self-development world, uh, there's a lot of talk about like morning routines, evening routines. Uh, the thought is that, you know, um, that uh, habits over time build success. So because they compound. So if you uh, visualize your success for 10 minutes every morning, uh, ultimately that's what you'll be thinking more about. Therefore, you'll be more successful. Um, what kind of habits do you have? Do you have any special habits in the morning or, or, or is it just a normal... My favorite saying of Mahatma Gandhi's is that your your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits. Your habits form your character, and your character determines your destiny. So there is that is the, the process, and it all starts with this belief and drive, uh, and then everything flows from that. And of course, with the right values is the most important thing, um, and. Uh, and in, in, in terms of my in, in the habits that I've developed are, are very much based on uh, on the life that I lead, on, on getting things done, on achieving as much as I can, on contributing as much as I can. Uh, and you know, if it means four hours sleep a night, it's four hours sleep a night. And you just get on with it. Uh, so you've um, you've started, you've sold Polo Sticks, you, you've got a product that you know works because you've been handing out these samples people are saying okay we like this this blend of beer um, it goes nice with curries and, and, and other food um, and so you now you're now on a roll right um, but you started in a Fulham flat and you had how did you because a lot of people say oh I don't have I didn't I don't have any money to start a business it's okay for you because you have money but I don't have money so I can't start a business how did you fund the whole um, upstart. Yes, I have no money. I come, I always say I come from a privileged background, but I've never had any money. My father couldn't afford to fund me. He was a, an army officer in India. They didn't get paid very well in those days. And so I, we had to raise all our money. I had student debt to pay off, which is a very normal thing now in the UK. Uh, so we, you know, we got a bank overdraft for £7,000. That was our first uh, photo sticks, my first photo stick sale. I managed to get the customer to pay me half the money up front. Um, I worked for the first six months when we were starting a business, so I was getting some other income. So I'd work in the evenings, weekends. And of course, once we started working on the beer idea, we had to focus and just drop everything else, give up all our work, and just work flat out on the beer. And then you have to raise the money to do that. And we were able to use all sorts of forms of finance, trade finance, Government small firms don't guarantee schemes, the enterprise investment scheme, redeemable preference shares, convertible cumulative redeemable preference shares, uh, factoring, invoice discounting. So every form of finance we could, we could try and raise and using good firm accountants. We're very lucky to work with Grant Thornton or top firm accountants. So they helped us uh, and uh, so we you know, did whatever we could to raise money to grow. So you were constantly asking yourselves, uh, what, what can we do? What can we do? Is that the question that sort of you said? Okay, I don't have I don't have any funds, but what can I do to make this? You happen? have you have to raise the money, otherwise you can't move forward. Uh, and nowadays there are even more sources of finance we didn't have in our time, like crowdfunding, for example. Mm. Yeah, because today you could have you could have gone to Kickstarter or uh, any of these Indiegogo, Indiegogo and you could have made a cool which video, we which we didn't have. Yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people saying that this is the absolute best time in history to start a business. There's more opportunity, there's more scale, there's more access to knowledge, there's more this and more that. Uh, are we seeing a, a, a massive, massive entrepreneurial culture being built in Britain or is it the same as before? Well, well it's a huge transformation the same way in India. The India that I left over 30 years ago compared to the India today is chalk and cheese. I mean, the India that I left was a loser economy going nowhere and a closed protected economy. The India today is an emerging global economic superpower, the fastest growing major economy in the world, growing at 7.6% a year that the whole world is looking to and wants to do business with. And the UK that I came to in the early 1980s was a sick man of Europe with no respect to the world economy, with entrepreneurship looked down upon. Um, and now the UK is the envy of Europe and the most successful economy in Europe and the fifth largest economy in the world and when it comes to entrepreneurship the UK is now recognized as one of the most the best countries in the world for entrepreneurship. London is one of the top cities in the world for entrepreneurship in every ranking uh, because it's an open economy, entrepreneurship is encouraged, it's flourishing, it's celebrated, it's cool to be an entrepreneur. And what, what happened culturally do you think from, from when you came to the UK up until now? What, how did the UK become the leader? It changed because uh, the UK um, in the early 80s, Margaret Thatcher had come into power and she transformed this country. Uh, like her or not, uh, she opened up Britain's economy, she encouraged enterprise, she encouraged entrepreneurship, celebrated entrepreneurship, um, and we've never looked back since then. And uh, compared to the US, uh, I mean, the, the U.S. has lots of different visas where you can invest money, you can get access to the U.S. Uh, the U.K. has some similar schemes. Um, what would you say is the advantage over the U.S.? Uh, so, let's say you have a company in India, why would you choose the U.K. rather than the U.S.? They both have their advantages. The U.K., for example, uh, geographically, uh, where we're located is a great location to be because you are the centre of the world. Uh, we're a gateway to Europe, to a 500 million, pound mark, 500 million people market. Uh, we have access to the Middle East, we have access to America, to Canada, and of course to Asia. Uh, so we're very well positioned uh, from, from a global point of view. And we've got this wonderful open economy. Uh, the United States has huge advantages. It's a giant economy. It's the world's only superpower. Uh, it has a great entrepreneurial uh, landscape and an atmosphere. It's very good at investing in innovation and research and development. Uh, the funding uh, and support for entrepreneurship is very good in the United States. Uh, so both countries are outstanding when it comes to entrepreneurship. And when it comes to higher education, the, the two countries that have the best universities in the world as well. So let's go back to the early days of Cobra again. Uh, you had a business partner when you were starting out. How important was it to have a business partner? It was crucial. Uh, I could never have done it on my own. My partner, Arjun Reddy, and I, um, our families have known each other for four generations. We come from Hyderabad, so the most important thing that was complete trust. I literally would have trusted Arjun with my life. And uh, so we had complete trust. We had complementary skills, and we were able to set up the business. We could not have done it on, 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 on my own. And of course, a lot of these partnerships, if you look at other situations like Richard Branson or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, they all had partners when they started. They didn't necessarily last, uh, but I, I could not have done it on my own. One of the things that you talk a lot about is, is building a team um, when you have a business. How, how do you attract a good team um, into your business? Uh, the, when you get a product, if the product is important at the right price, You've got to make it available. The place I have my ten P's of building a business. Mm -hmm. You're going to promote it. So sales, public relations, advertising, marketing, field sales, tele sales, point of sales. And then people without people, nothing can happen. Finance, spelled P H. Um, passion. You've got to be passionate about your 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 business. Um, the right principles. It's got to be profitable. And so, if you look at all the 
the, the P's of, 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 of doing business, um, one of the most important things is, is, is the people side of it. And um, I've been lucky to build a very, very good team. And right at the beginning, if you've got a successful business, um, the business is going places, people want to be a part of that journey. And we were able to, and your enthusiasm, um, and excitement of a growing young venture uh, is something people want to be part of. Uh, and then you've got to create an atmosphere where your team um, is allowed to get on with things, come up with ideas, make them happen, uh, and then you can achieve incredible things. So, um, a lot of entrepreneurs have scars from from other people. So, um, you know, they, they they listen to people like yourself. You know, they want to build a team, but then they have like a, um, like a bad seed um, that creates a lot of challenges in in the business. Um, how do you how do you deal with that? Let's like, let's say you've managed to hire a psychopath, and they're sort of disrupting your team and 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 you know doing what they do, sort of uh, plotting some people against other people. And how do you deal with that situation? And how do you not let get uh, let yourself get down? What when you have people systematically who... destroying your team? So we all make mistakes. I mean, my one of my favorite sayings is "Good judgment comes from." Experience and experience comes from bad judgment, and um, occasionally you will you will hire the wrong person. And we had a very clear principle in in, in our growth of career. If there was somebody who was creating problems and was a bad egg, the most important thing is for that person to leave as soon as possible because it can be very destructive and it can spoil this whole wonderful atmosphere that you create. And that's a family team atmosphere where everyone's working together, everyone's happy and efficient, everyone's going the extra mile, and you have one person who could be very disruptive. And we had it on occasion. Uh, and of course, we, I, I've made huge mistakes in hiring the wrong senior leaders who could almost destroy a business. Mm. So, you you mentioned um, that uh, at three different times in Cobra, the company was nearly taken out. Um, can, you, can you take us through those three times and also um, how did you uh, keep on going, how did you survive sort of mentally, um, how did you make, how did you make Cobra survive when it nearly was taken out? So uh, three times I nearly lost my business. The first time was when um, I had started a magazine, a trade magazine for the Indian restaurants. There wasn't a trade magazine for the curry restaurants in the UK. So we started one, it was a free circulation magazine, and uh, I was a publisher, I owned just under half of it, um, and then there was an editor who actually wrote and put the magazine together with his team. And after the first couple of years, it was a standard of business in a separate office from Cobra, and quite frankly, I didn't have anything to do with the editor editing of the, of the uh, publication at all, and in fact, Cobra advertises, regular advertises the magazine. And uh, there was an article written by the editor on the service in, in the Indian restaurants in which he criticized the service in the Indian restaurants in a way that upset the industry. And uh, as a result, there was a boycott of Cobra beer. Um, and that boycott lasted almost a year until we were able to, to convince the restaurants that it was nothing to do with Cobra beer. Customers, uh, and the boycott was eventually uh, withdrawn a year later. Uh, and during that period, I could easily have lost my business. Uh, it was a very trying period, very difficult period. I had to. We were expanding very rapidly. We were growing at seventy percent a year compound, and we'd set up depots around the country. We'd set up our own delivery systems, our vans. Um, and we had to retrench from those days from over 125 people down to less than 20 people. It was a horrible thing. It was the only way to survive. Um, and in spite of all that, our sales still grew by 3% that year, which shows the strength of the brand. And in the end, um, what got us through, I think, was our integrity and um, my team, the support of my team. In fact, the three things that get you through a crisis um, are a strong brand, the support of your team and your family, uh, and your values. Your uh, the second time was um, we were raising finance uh, for expansion in, in 
2007-2008, and we managed to get the largest drinks company in the world at the time to invest in us as a minority shareholder and a strategic partner. The deal was agreed, the due diligence was done, the contracts were waiting to be signed, the teams had started integrating, and two weeks before Lehman's went bust, they pulled out, and we had run out of money, and we could have gone bust then. But luckily, I had a plan B and was able to raise some funds to keep us going. And the third time was the financial crisis in 2008-9, when we were forced to put the company on for sale by a hedge fund investor uh, that invested in us. And we went through a sale process in the worst economic climate you can imagine. We were highly geared, we had too much debt. I had the wrong team leading the company. I made serious mistakes in that. Um, and we, once again, we didn't see the financial crisis coming, but then who did, mm. except for two economists in the world, Rubini and the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Robert Ram Raj. And uh, so that was a horrible period where, again, luckily, uh, we were able to survive by forming a joint venture with Wilson Coors, one of the largest growers in the world. And, uh, and what saw us through, once again, was strength of the brand, strong support from my team and family and our values and integrity. How did it, um, how did it feel, so, because when you saw, so in 2009 when, when you had to sell out more of your business, um, you lost control of the business. How does that, how does that feel? Well, I didn't lose control of the business, it's a joint venture where I'm the chairman of the joint venture, okay. both globally as well as joint venture having most calls in India. So, fully integrated and involved in the business, leading the business. Okay. A lot, a lot of people are, a lot of entrepreneurs are scared of, of um, sharing their pie, uh, doing joint ventures, doing partnerships. Um, would you say they're crucial for success or, or, or to scale? Sometimes they're necessary. So, in our case, the joint venture um, has many advantages. Um, and there are of course advantages, but of course once you're in a joint venture with a giant company, uh, giant companies are, are, are big and are inherently going to be slower at doing things and making things happen than an entrepreneurial company, where the biggest advantage of an entrepreneurial company is being fleet of foot. So what would take an entrepreneurial company a week to do might take a giant company months to do. Uh, so that is, there is a trade-off then you have the advantages of a giant company and their financial muscle, manufacturing muscle, distribution muscle, sales muscle, marketing muscle. Um, in terms of debating, just changing the subject entirely, um, you did debating in, in university. Um, I used to be a member of Junior Chamber International and, yes. and there they, they do debating, uh, they do a lot of speaking. And at the time when I was starting out as an entrepreneur, I, I just didn't get the point. Like, why? What, what's the point of debating? What's the what's the point of you know uh, public speaking? Uh, I just wanted to sort of uh, you know sell more stuff and sort of build up the business. Um, how important has debating and, and speaking been for you and and, and uh, in your career? I first started debating at school at the age of fourteen. And then I uh, used to debate at university in India and Hyderabad, including with the JCs. The oh. JCs. Yes. Okay. And then I debated when I was at, uh, at the International Students' House in London, and then of course at Cambridge. I led the Cambridge Union debating team two years running against Oxford. So it's been a big part of, of my growing up, and it's, a, I think, a huge advantage um, to be able to communicate uh, in front of hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, and when you're uh, a leader leading a business of any size, uh, communication is absolutely key. Uh, and uh, those debating skills, I think, are very valuable. And of course, now in Parliament, um, I debate as part of my life there as well. So let's talk about that uh, House of Lords. Um, how do you become a lord, and and is that your your grandfather's? Uh, uh, sort of influencing you uh, in terms of your, that choice? 
Well, my great grandfather's influence was there, and then I was lucky I got the opportunity when uh, uh, Tony Blair, when he was Prime Minister, created the House of Lords Appointments Commission, which enabled uh, anyone to apply to become a member of the House of Lords. Uh, and and uh, a couple of people were appointed a year through that route. Uh, I was sent a form by the Appointments Commission saying, would you be interested in applying? And I thought, well, I've got to lose. I've always been interested in this area. And so I was appointed as an independent cross century at the House of Lords. 20% of the House of Lords are independent, not allied to any party. And the other 80% are made up of the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, and one of the two other parties. So um, that's how I joined as an independent cross century. And what, what, does, what does cross bench mean? Um, it means you're independent. You do not, okay. do not belong to any political party. Okay. So that means every time there's, a, there's an issue, speak from an independent point, a point of view, not towing any party line. And when there's a vote, you vote issue by issue. Sometimes you'll be voting for the government, sometimes you're voting against them, depending on the issue. Whereas party political figures will, on the whole, vote the way they're told to by their party. And uh, in terms of your, your political career, um, will we see any, any other Things happening? Are you? Do you have any? What's your What's your goal in politics? I have no, uh, because of, uh, of my uh, the import of the business in my life and the other things that I, I do. Um, uh, if I, for example, went down the route of, of uh, becoming a minister or taking a, a, a role like that, I'd have to give up my business interests, which I wouldn't be prepared to do. So I have no such ambitions at the moment. But you never know in the future. What kind of business ventures are you looking at at the moment? What kind of business ventures excite you? Well, I'm fully engaged with with Cobra. There's so much more to expand. Uh, we uh, are a household name in Britain. We're one of the top 20 beer brands in Britain. And we've still got so much growth potential here in the UK. We're available at 98.6% of all the Indian restaurants, the curry restaurants. We're available in all the supermarkets major supermarket chains, whether it's Tesco, St. Louis, Waitrose, or Asda, uh, Morris. Uh, we are available in all the independent off-licenses and wine shops in the cash and carry sector and the wholesale sector. And now increasingly we're making a breakthrough into the pubs and the bars and uh, the mainstream restaurants and hotels. We're now stocked in Turkish restaurants, we're stocked in Thai restaurants, Chinese restaurants. Uh, so the expansion for Cobra just to the UK alone, we could be three years three times bigger within three years. Um, in terms of exports, we've got 40 countries that uh, we export to, uh, including most of the European countries. Uh, and we also uh, are manufactured in Belgium, in the UK, and in India. But a lot of export potential for Cobra. We're about to launch in Canada, and Australia, Japan in a bigger way, uh, South Africa in a bigger way. So a lot of export, export potential uh, for Cobra. And then I'm the senior independent director of Booker, the largest wholesaler in Britain, which I've been for eight and a half years. And we've just started a new tech venture called Big Tosa, which is an instant photo messaging app. Uh, it has some of the best aspects of Snapchat, Instagram, WhatsApp, Vine, and even Dropbox. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful differentiated instant photo messaging. I, I, I really want I really want an app where all the apps are in the app. So Snapchat, Facebook, WhatsApp, everything goes to the same messaging system. That because you know I have a mastermind group. I was like, oh, I'm going to create a WhatsApp uh, group for for the group, and and people are like, no, let's use this, let's use that. I don't want to use WhatsApp, and I'm like, okay, can we just not have one app for everything? <laughs> So, um, what can what can our listeners uh, do for you? Uh, is there anything we can do for you? Be entrepreneurs and and uh, love Cobra Beer. Absolutely, Lord Billy Moria. Thank you so much for for being on the show. Uh, you can read more about Lord Billy Moria at .co .uk. Uh, or just Google Cobra Bear, he will show up. Oh, by the way, do you have any more books coming out? Are you are you working on any more books? Uh, not at the moment. Um, 
I mean, I, I do publish articles from time to time on a regular basis on issues of the day. Uh, but uh, after Bottle for Business and Against the Grain, at some stage I must bring out uh, another book sharing my entrepreneurial lessons. Absolutely. Guys, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit like underneath, share it on wherever you like sharing things, and uh, stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you so much for being on the show. And, uh, and cheers. <laughs> cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks. This podcast is brought to you by MrOutsource.com. Outsourcing to the Philippines done for you. Mr. Outsource is a recruitment company matching busy entrepreneurs with Filipino virtual assistants. So you can have the time to focus on what's important.